American group, the American original. For over the last 10 seconds, the sharpest Satoshis, the best Bitcoins, the hardest cryptocurrency talk. This week, we'd like to welcome Chris J from Feathercoin. Hello. Derek J. Freeman from Peace Propagandist and Peace News Now. Peace, y'all. And Will Pangman from Bitcoin Milwaukee. Hi, everybody. Issue one, Satoshi Nakamoto unmasked. Newsweek returned to print journalism with a bold cover story claiming that they have found Satoshi Nakamoto. The story was later proved false by the Associated Press and the Los Angeles Times when Dorius Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto told them that he was not Satoshi. Later developments even involved Satoshi himself coming out of hiding to post a message on an old forum. The message said only, I am not Dorian Nakamoto. Newsweek, however, is sticking with the story. Chris J., your thoughts on this exciting and developing story. <coughs> oh, sorry, is that how you meant to start an interview? No, apparently not. Dude, seriously, this is, this is, I'm really upset. I'm really upset. What did I want to say? I had something I wanted to say. The videos of her are just unbelievable. I think I know what happened. What happened was she really, really, really wanted this guy to be Satoshi Nakamoto so that she could make a career out of this. And I've been saying this for a long time now. Do not bother even reading these online tabloids. Tabloid doesn't scale. It doesn't work on the internet. Because what happens is people are very, very good at finding things that are untrue. That's what Wikipedia was based on. The way to find the right answer was by being wrong first. Except on Wikipedia, you can actually edit the content. And so you can't on, on things like Newsweek. So this um, Leah Goodman woman, um, I don't know, she calls herself a journalist? Does she even use that title? She, she's been doing some interviews. Um, she's been pretty much going around all of these, that like CNN and a few others. Is that right? And you, you've been sending me those. And she yeah, just has this, in my opinion, she has this guilty looking, you know, this guilty look on her. Like, she knows she's wrong. Like, I almost feel like she just needs to meet up with MT Gox and just sit down and go, okay, we've, we've, we've been afflicted, we've been, afflict we've been caught out, we're both struggling to take responsibility. You blame the blockchain protocol, can I do that? Can I, can, I, can I do that? So she's clearly caught out here. This dude isn't Satoshi, I'm pretty convinced of that. Like, I think what's happened is she so badly wanted it to be true, she dropped the word Bitcoin into enough conversations and then just hope that he would say something incriminating. And clearly from Dorian's point of view, he's got stuff in his past that he is fearful of being brought up. She's come up to him and he thinks that she's talking about something completely unrelated. So he then goes on the defensive and says, no, no, I have nothing to do with that company anymore. And you've got this kind of weird misalignment of her wanting it to be Satoshi, but him thinking it's something completely different and saying something off the cuff that she's then gone, oh, that's it. That, that, that bit that he said there where I've got nothing more to do with that company, that must be the incriminating evidence. And then she's gone away. I mean, the opening line on its own uh, to that article um, was just astonishing. Like, she hasn't... She hasn't checked the facts before going to the graphics team. The license plate wasn't even blurred out. I mean, I'd have done that myself, wouldn't you? I did. When I posted the story, it took me about five yeah. seconds to uh, circle the license plate, black it out. I also then noticed that you could see the street number of the house. And so I blacked that out as well. I didn't yeah. do anything, but it took me five seconds, and I did it because that's what I, I did. Mean, she's just been cavalier. She just hasn't taken any real care over this. Satoshi Nakamoto stands at the end of his sun-baked driveway, looking timorous and annoyed. That's the opening line. Like, that, that sounds like she's going, like, maybe she wants a publisher deal. Maybe she's trying to write a book. Maybe, maybe that's the angle she's going with. But it's clearly backfiring. I don't know how she's going to recover from this. 
because it, to me, I don't know about you guys, but it doesn't look like this dude is Satoshi. And what with the Satoshi, right? I mean, of course, she might argue that that was just Dorian, right? Like going going online and 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 posting that up. But I mean, okay, you know, guys, tell me what you think. Well, I think the the obvious comparison is the emails. There's been a couple of graphics going around comparing an email from Mr. Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto and Satoshi Nakamoto of Bitcoin. The Dorian Prentice email has poor capitalization, poor grammar. Yeah. It's yeah, just I saw not that. very well thought out. It's not a great email. The uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, the abstract, the way he introduces Bitcoin, he speaks very fluently. He uses proper grammar and punctuation and, of course, the famous two spaces after the period showing that he was taught to type on a manual typewriter, uh, not on a keyboard. Uh, the other email doesn't have any of these characteristics. So even on the most basic of cursory readings, that stands out as a reason why they shouldn't have published this story. They also shouldn't have published his home address, his house, his car, his license plate. Uh, yeah. Unbelievable. And especially now, what you're seeing uh, when that lady goes on the news, is it supposed to be the day two round of successful stories? I believe that she scheduled these interviews and expected Satoshi to come yeah. along, and that this was her victory lap. This is Maybe. her celebration. And it's a, the strangest things I've, I've ever seen. Newsweek is going on with the celebration, despite being disproven by the LA Times, the Associated Press, and presumably Satoshi Nakamoto himself. The victory. Well, this, lap this is this is what Mark Carpellis did. He wouldn't he wouldn't admit the truth, and he just tried to kick the can down the road, put it off, put it off. As if that was going to prevent the truth from eventually coming out. Uh, I just think it's just so obvious to everyone in the room right now that they've clearly made a mistake. Even if it does, from some freak, you know, uh, accident, turn out to be that they got the right guy. Uh, it's still not appropriate what she did. You know, publishing the article that way without consulting him, without properly sitting down and thinking ethically about, you know. What, what what they should do. What they did is they just went straight ahead and wrote a sensationalist article. And that clearly just shows that she, all she's really, it's selfish, all she's really concerned about from what it looks like from here is her own career. I especially didn't like that she said she had a graphics team and she tried to blame them on not blacking out the license. Plate. Right, that's right. That's, that's like the article. Like That's like the malleability through, thing. This thing went into print, presumably, with his plate. I, I haven't yeah. seen print edition. I tried to get one. They, they didn't have any. I don't know if they Yeah, you do not. You, that's like the, the, the transaction malleability thing. That's what Gox did. They just blamed it on something else. That's exactly well, that's what, what I'm talking about. That's what the graphics team should have said. It was because of a transaction malleability. <laughs> yeah. Photoshop's protocol was wrong. Like to join us. Yeah, Newsweek is the new ministry of truth to me. I mean, they, they write it and it is true, right? You know, the... It was totally irresponsible of this author to publish this article without truth. I mean, the Newsweek article, if you read it, it reads like a trashy romantic novella. It's uh, not based on truth. And in the age of cryptography, we have objective methods of determining what is or is not authentic. And that was not presented. Uh, none of that evidence was presented. No signed uh, PGP keys. Uh, no audio evidence was brought forward saying, like, here, I interviewed him. He said different things to me. Now she's going on this circuit doing interviews saying, well, I don't know why he's answering these questions so differently and why he's talking about Bitcoin like it's a company, like he has no understanding of what it is. He calls it a product uh, of some company. Uh, and says he never worked there. Where? What are you talking about? Dorian clearly has no idea what just fell into his lap, and this woman is highly irresponsible and dangerous for putting such a target on this man. She, she got people all around the country and, in fact, the world to believe that this man was sitting here in his home with $400 million. Uh, he could have been abducted. He could have been tortured for his keys that don't even exist. So she is a, a dangerous person. She should take full responsibility for uh, being a poor journalist and just move on with her life. Uh, she did enough damage. Just end it now. I agree, Derek. The details in that article were incredibly salacious. I remember reading it through for the first time on air yesterday, and things like uh, he is descended from samurai and his mother was a Buddhist priest. These small details of incredible history, the police officer who walks to the door instantly knows who Satoshi is and knows that he shouldn't be living in a normal house like this. Well, we don't want to... I mean, Satoshi, 
obviously has taken great pains to protect his privacy and anonymity. So for him to call the police on a reporter with regard to an inquiry or an investigation on Bitcoin is highly suspect to me. Uh, he wouldn't want a police report with his full real name and address and uh, an investigation on Bitcoin with the authorities if you're in any way interested in keeping your anonymity. And it, it does seem the reason that she doesn't produce audio of a sit-down interview with Satoshi, uh, Dorian Prentice Satoshi, is that she doesn't have one. It seems she has this one meeting with him where the police come and he tells her to leave. He says he's not involved anymore, and she takes that to mean the entire thing. That's I mean, what hubris? Was, was Leah born yesterday? Uh, does she think that no one else is looking for Satoshi or has, has ever tried to investigate this guy? Does she think, oh, well, all I had to do was make a couple of phone calls at Newsweek, and then, boom, there's the most anonymous guy on the planet. And remember, their initial reporting method was to look at all the people named Satoshi Nakamoto. In Leah's uh, interviews today, she says that she didn't even believe it was a pseudonym, and because it wasn't a pseudonym, it was okay to publish him, that he meant to be public by using his quote-unquote real name. Which She's isn't... making a lot of assumptions with her article, and we all know what that means. It does seem that the, the day two coverage that she's doing by going on these various media outlets is only making things worse. Mr. Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto does not have $400 million. It's incredibly unsafe for her to be going on the media saying that he is the man when he has denied being the man. Uh, he's most certainly going to have to relocate. I don't know what's going to happen to him in the future. It's very unfortunate what's happening. Will Pengman, your thoughts? Uh, does, while watching these videos of her doing her press tour, does, does anyone else out there have this feel? I know other people have had this similar feeling of when you watch something on television or a movie, or, or you witness something in person, and it's not happening to you, you're just watching it, but you're embarrassed on behalf of them. Like, you have this kind of yucky embarrassment inside of you for, like, for their sake or something, and it almost compels you to change the channel or look away or um, help that person if they're in front of you in real life. That's what I felt watching her on these videos. It's pretty uh, just uncomfortable. It's like... Um, you know, some people get that same feeling when they, uh, like, you know, oh, you know, little tactile things skeeve you out, like scratching ice for some people. Or I had a basketball coach who, when we would kick dirt uh, on the sideline of our outdoor basketball court, he would get all skeeved out. He couldn't handle it. That's how I felt watching her on these, on these interviews. It's just really awful. The other thing is, you know, what a responsible journalist would have done if they really thought they might have uncovered this little treasure trove of a story is carefully contact this person, gain their trust, encourage them that you would write a, you know, a conscientious story on it, cautiously relocate them considering the fact that there's a $400 million bounty you're going to place on their head, whether that's the right person or the wrong person, as soon as you publish and help them, you know, get into like a witness protection-y sort of situation for their own safety, a cautious reporter would have pooled these kinds of resources and been careful in that kind of a way, you know, maybe not those specific things, but something to that effect. Um, this is an incredibly specious uh, story in the first place, like you guys were mentioning. The fact that someone who went to great pains to preserve their anonymity that more than likely is more than one person, um, or at least you know certainly could be potentially more than one person as the as the creator of Bitcoin uh, would use their real name or even part of their real name, to, you know while communicating through PGP keys and you know just all of the an anonymity that um, they preserved over the years of building the early stages of Bitcoin, it's it you know it's preposterous on its face that this man could potentially be the real Satoshi. Not to mention the fact that, you know, there was one other, like, ridiculous claim that I believe was made in the story that uh, you didn't mention earlier, Tom, when you were giving your little rundown, and that is that this was a man who worked on government black projects or classified uh, government defense contractors, 
you know, cryptography and mathematics projects, you know. So that was another one of these outlandish sort of, um, you know, specious claims that she made that, uh, you know, was her evidence that she's claiming in these interviews is not circumstantial. She's defending the quote-unquote evidence she's giving as not circumstantial evidence. And certainly that's the big criticism that the Bitcoin community had for this article is there's no... There's no hard proof, you know, when, when, even when people do a Reddit AMA, the Redditors or the Reddit community asks for proof, and that's usually in the form of like a tweet or something like that, but none of this was used on her behalf to prove her, her claim. Um, and then, again, we've talked about how irresponsible this is to just come out with this stuff, let, al let alone put his house and car, license plate, um, all these things on television, but the fact that this essentially represents a $400 million bounty on a man's head. Whether she's right or wrong, and she appears to have been oblivious or so careless uh, to that fact. So um, she, I, she I, don't wish, I don't wish ill on her. Um, I, I just wish that she uh, gets, you know, one, thing, one of the things that gives me so much faith in, the, in, the, in Bitcoin as a whole and the community... And, and as people come to this community, um, exponential growth that we're seeing, what I'm seeing is kind of like this unplugging from, uh, from the, the lies or the misinformation, the misconceptions that the rest of the world is foisting on the population. And, you know, I think that's what I'm really liking to see in the comments section of Newsweek articles or their non-pology that they published today, too, uh, the comment section was replete with, um, you know, intelligent remarks about, uh, you know, some a little aggressive, but certainly, you know, nobody would, it's not like the comment section you'll see on, you know, a Fox uh, News article or an MSNBC article or, or, you know, other things where it's just, you know, non sequiturs and, and just, um, just falsehoods and fallacies galore. Um, so I'm encouraged by seeing those things, and I hope that continues, and that those are the consequences that she has. That that's the outcome. Um, is that the legitimate consequences that are deserved here are are what befall this situation? She does seem incredibly naive and oblivious. Her comments today on the various news outlets show her saying that there's no reason that an inventor has anything to fear from inventing something which is an incredibly historically ignorant position. If you invent something that threatens the status quo, it could come back to you. There's a reason that Satoshi Nakamoto is anonymous and private. He's yeah, for a journalist, she has no concept or knowledge of history. It's unbelievable that she would reach the position as a financial editor at Newsweek and not have any of this history. Did you hear that comment she made about how she covers people that have got like net worths of you know billions that they work at all these I big banks and apparent I mean it's the just... billionaires are safe therefore he's safe yeah it's really disappointing it's very absurd what's going on and this this day two coverage will, will most certainly be used in the lawsuit if Mr. Dorian Prentice decides to sue Newsweek for what they've done to him if mm. you look at the situation he pretty much is going to have to move he probably needs a new car at the very least a new license plate uh, oh, they're going. The they're going to settle, aren't they? They're going to settle, aren't they? Surely. The lawsuit, yeah, they'll they'll likely Newsweek will settle. Uh, or he so what? Magazine. So what we should do, you know, um, I'm sure folks who are probably watching tonight were maybe witness to or even a part of the uh, the Twitter bomb yesterday, the We Are Satoshi hashtag or the I Am Satoshi hashtag. I think we all have a legitimate claim to that moniker. And we should start a class action suit for defamation or whatever it would be, you know. Uh, if, if there's a settlement, let's go class action with it and not make it end. I mean, let's not let them out of the woods on this, you know. This is what I'm saying is um, a lot of these news agencies or these bureaucracies or any of these uh, establishment organizations can sweep their lies and misgivings and, and miscalculations under the rug very easily. I mean, we see this in politics all the time. Uh, the, you know, one controversy replaces an old controversy, and the old controversy just evaporates. Uh, you know, I guess my comment earlier about the Bitcoin community and what, what, what it does to the mindset of people and shedding all of this, uh, 
this, the, you know, unlearning all of this stuff that um, has been foisted on us is, you know, we can come out and, um, and, and expose it for what it is and not allow this stuff to be swept under the rug. Derek, do you have a thought? Well, I'm less interested in retribution and punishing Newsweek and more interested in helping and protecting poor Dorian. I'm encouraged by Andreas's uh, fundraiser, which I'm sure all the listeners are familiar with, uh, that uh, I don't know the, w the website or where you can find it. Uh, I think you've got one. There you go. Thanks, Thomas. On uh, but, r slash Bitcoin, it should be near the top. It has uh, 1,132 upvotes. Right on. And it's been encouraging. I was watching the donations come in by the second uh, earlier today, and it's, uh, it's, it's up there quite a bit. I guess you're, you're showing the totals now afloat somewhere around 27 Bitcoin. While I was looking earlier today, I watched it cross over from 11 to 12, and uh, I thought that was inspiring. <laughs> now it's more than doubled. So it's clear that people in the Bitcoin community are interested in helping out those in need, and uh, look at what they've done so far. I, I don't think we need to worry about punishing Newsweek. Let's just move on yeah. and uh, just keep building the free future. I'm not in favor of punishing them, just to clarify, but I want to hold them to account. And I think the Bitcoin community as a whole does too. And one thing well, we can do... Good luck doing that with the class action lawsuit. Cause I don't well, think I know. That was a kind of a joke. I was, that was tongue-in-cheek. But what we can do to hold them to account is point out the, what you just mentioned, Derek, that the money that's been raised on, um, you know, with Andreas's fundraiser for Dorian Nakamoto, that's a story. That's a story. Get that in some press. That deserves some press, and that likely won't see the light of day in the mainstream news. Um, maybe we can encourage Matt Miller from Bloomberg to cover something like that and piggyback off of that. But that's a way to hold them to account. Look at what well, the Bitcoin community Who cares what the is mainstream media is talking about? They're dead anyway. It's, it's all about the independent media, and we are reporting it. Yeah, let's hasten, let's hasten the demise. I think this is one way to do it, by taking a grassroots approach to, to this, kind of, um, this kind of news and this kind of uh, um, alternative, journal alternative media. Yeah, well, that's the last thing I'll say on it, is this was a real opportunity to let independent media shine and let the old world dinosaurs dig their own grave. Because Newsweek never should have gone back into print, especially with a cover story like this. And independent media tore them a new app, a new, uh, <laughs> we'll give us a family show. <laughs> and it all happened live on Twitter. I was there. It was an incredible story with the LA Times, the AP, Twitter, and the internet working together. Uh, as for punishment for the Newsweek writer, it's not for me to say or us to say, but the internet works this way. If you embarrass someone on the internet, it comes back to you. The things that she did, exposing his license plate, exposing his home, exposing his car, I imagine will be done to her. Mm -hmm. I uh, don't know what's going to happen. I hope that she'll be okay. But uh, Dorian Prentice, Satoshi Nakamoto, his life has been forever changed. And mm -hmm. I wouldn't be surprised if her life is forever changed. Yeah, I, I just want to make one thing clear. You know, personally, philosophically, I reject punishment as a model for... Um, restoration or re re retribution. Uh, I prefer restorative justice to re retributive justice, and I just want that to be clear. We are watching the fundraiser right now. This is a fundraiser set up by Andreas Antonopoulos. If you're curious about what will be done with the funds, Andreas has made it very clear that he will accept donations until the end of March. At the end of March, donations will be converted into USD and delivered to Dorian Nakamoto. If the donation is rejected by Dorian, the funds will go to a charity of his choice. If he doesn't want to choose a charity, the funds will be donated to the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Any funds sent after the deadline will be donated to Dorian at a later date or a charity of his choice or the EFF above. Andreas has all of the details. The donation address is 1 Dorian 4 Rocks. It's very identifiable. And here's the blockchain.info page for the donation address, you can use the QR code on your screen right now to donate to Dorian Prentice Satoshi Nakamoto, who is not Satoshi Nakamoto. While we've been watching it, the donations have just climbed above 1,100 donations. That means more than 1,000 individuals have donated to this campaign, and they have raised more than $17,000, which is uh, 26.99 Bitcoin just about ready to go over 27.
I'd be curious to see what the average donation is um, to see how much people are throwing in. It looks like the average donation floats somewhere around 10 or 20 bucks. What would you say? Last time I checked the average, it was at about $15. So. Yeah. Exit question. Will Satoshi ever be unmasked? Will we ever find out if he has the keys to the 1.65 million Bitcoins? Chris J. Uh, not unless he actually wants to. I think what might happen is that the press just keep going off on this obsession and he ends up being forced to declare who he is just so that they stop harassing innocent people. That's the, that's the only thing. It, it's remarkable in this day and age how you can stay anonymous for that long. Just given all the technology improvements we have with stylometry, the ability to be able to uh, identify somebody by their style of writing, um, it, it's pretty astonishing. Um, so I have absolutely no idea. I really don't think it's that important. Yes, I would be intrigued to find out who it is, but I don't think it's as important as we're making it out to be. Derek J. Uh, yes, I expect to one day know the true identity of Satoshi Nakamoto. I hope it's some sort of deathbed confession uh, where it's his time of choosing and uh, that he has a good record of his diary so that he can say, boy, back in March of 2014 when I was watching the Bitcoin group, it was hilarious to see them talk about me. Uh, you know, stuff like that. I want to see what what is he doing these days. Um, you know, I can't know that now, but maybe I can know that later on in the future. Will Pangman. I have it on good authority that we will never know who Satoshi Nakamoto is and also that the keys were destroyed. So um, that's something that, uh, you know, is interesting to think about, I think. Issue 2. Two-Bit Idiot Declares War on the Bitcoin Foundation. This might not sound like much, but 2-Bit Idiot is the same Ryan Galt, writer from Coindesk, who broke the leaked Mt. Gox presentation that first broke the news of how many Bitcoins they were missing and what they planned to do about it. He has done it again. This time he's asking Chairman Peter Vicenis and Executive Director John Matonis of the Bitcoin Foundation to resign in 72 hours, or he will release information showing that they had insider access to Mt. Gox and should have warned people about the exchange. Derek J., your thoughts. Will the Bitcoin Foundation resign? Should they resign? Is 2-Bit Idiot right? Is the current foundation in some way responsible for people's losses on Mt. Gox? Well, if there are, and 2-Bit Idiot has information about it, he should come forward with that if he feels it's his responsibility. I don't think it should be held as a threat over people's heads that they abdicate some invisible throne at the Bitcoin Foundation. What good is the Bitcoin Foundation anyway? Why not create your own? What, do they have some cool building that you want to inhabit? I mean, forget about it. 2-Bit uh, Idiot has already done his own uh, hard work of making a name for himself. He's done a great job, and people follow and care about what he says. Who cares what kind of title he's got at the Bitcoin Foundation? Who cares what these people do up in, in that ivory tower? I, I think it's a, a non-issue. If he wants to create his own Bitcoin Foundation, I'd encourage that. Will Pangman. Uh, so just to kind of parallel, you know, I, the 2-Bit Idiot had my ear after the Mt. Gox story um, turned out, you know, his, his information turned out to be true. And the parallel I want to draw is with uh, Leah Goodman's reporting of the Satoshi story. The Mt. Gox um, article or, or blog post that uh, Ryan wrote was careful and led off with a clear statement that what he had was unconfirmed um, and he had some sources and he had multiple sources and he really didn't, uh, you know, assert blanket statements of anything. He suggested some things, and he hoped that maybe the truth would bear out and, and things like that. Now, a lot of people um, were disturbed by that Mt. Gox story and, and her, um, you know, lost some sleep over it. But, um, but that was some careful reporting, if you will, on his part. The, I get the opposite feeling from him with this story. Uh, there's incredible hubris in his writing of this story. Um, very aggressive and uh, violent writing almost, you know. I mean, it's figurative language he uses, but 
certainly um, sounds like he's uh, too big for his britches now since the Mount Gox thing turned out to be more true, more or less. Um, so, yes, he has my ear on this. Um, to Derek's point about the foundation, you know, I've, you know, as someone who's participated on committees for the Bitcoin Foundation, and, you know, um, I'm not a lifetime member of the foundation. I'm a one-year member. I'm debating renewing my membership. I think I'd like to. You know, I'd like to see some things go a little differently. Namely, I'd like to see more, uh, less of the ivory tower sort of thing going on. I mean, uh, that's certainly, uh, I wouldn't say that's my feeling about the the board, but it's certainly the the feeling I get from a lot of the Bitcoin community. And you know, when I've tried to work on certain projects on these committees and uh, open the door to our Milwaukee meetup, to you know, with with uh, similar interests on some of these projects to collaborate or participate on these things, that's the feedback I get. Is that you know, members at our Milwaukee meetup and other people in the community feel like it's it's an ivory tower sort of, um, you know, some isolation going on there. Uh, you know, and us plebes are, are down here spinning our wheels or running the hamster wheel or whatever. Um, it, it doesn't need to be that way. And I really, you know, I really do think the foundation has performed some valuable functions, some really valuable functions. And there are good people who are on the board who I respect and appreciate their work. Charlie Schrem is one of them. Elizabeth Ploche is one of them. And there are, there are some others. Um, there have been some val there's a lot of valuable work they've done you know they've they've come to the aid of a lot of um, bitcoin businesses and they've performed a function of a kind of buffer between regulators bureaucracies and some of these businesses uh, some of these fledgling and, and and relatively large bitcoin startups and uh, that have vc money behind them and some of the smaller ones as well and so i do appreciate that but their focus has been so much in that function and almost none in the community support or um, advocacy or community outreach programs. There's uh, a lot of things that um, I've suggested a number of times on, on the committees that I'd like to see pulled into the fold of the foundation by the board, endorsed by the board, or supported uh, any number of ways that might be palatable for them to support some of the great work. I mentioned this in, in past shows, you know, Kristoff's book, um, Bitcoin Bigfoot and their airdrop of um, you know, Bitcoin educational paraphernalia and start guides and things like that. And there are other plans that that group has. And there's a number of other um, really great community activism. Um, they could really do wonders, and I've, I've proposed this to them, of pulling in meetup organizers around the country and the world and giving them more support and, and helping them have a more organized approach for their outreach. They're doing a great job. I talk to meetup organizers all the time, every week, and there's tons of great work going on there. Um, they could, I do think it can be pulled in and organized, not centrally, but certainly encouraged or, or you know, um, there's certainly uh, um, endowment that could support projects like that. Um, one of my earliest feelings about the Bitcoin Foundation as I was observing the support that they were giving these big, big businesses and buffering against the, the state, if you will, uh, was that there was no user-facing uh, functions that they were performing and there needed to be a kind of board body of some kind of you know a non-governmental organization of some kind to support the user adoption that was exploding during 2013 so I'm still interested in seeing something like that and putting something like that together suggesting it um, and, and working on it and that's what I'd like to see so the story is uh, salacious and um, you know even more aggressive perhaps than Leah Goodman's uh, claims in her story. We'll see by Monday if he's got teeth or if he's, you know, all bark. Chris, Jay. Anyone can be a leader. And the thing is that if you've got a platform like they have and, you, and you've got the name as well, the Bitcoin Foundation sounds very official, you've got the official association with the lead developer, you've got a responsibility and a duty of care. You could be helping people on the ground. Like you could be getting this out to developing countries, the people in the world, as as Andreas puts it so well, the the six billion unbanked, and I don't see that happening right now. 
I, if I do decide to, to run for it, I'd be running as a protest candidate. You'd be electing me to disband the thing or to at least curtail it, to take it right back. Really all the Bitcoin Foundation needs to do is pay for the developers. The, the reason that that's important is because if the developer works for free, like, like the Linux Foundation, if the developer works for free, it's not really free. He's taking it, he's billing someone for that time. He's taken out on his boss or you're, you're, pushing, you're pushing the cost off the balance sheet and you're creating what are called negative externalities which is actually what the banks do on, on a mass scale. They lock in profits and they externalize risks and obviously that's not healthy. We don't want to see that. If somebody uh, is working on the development full time and, and it's, it's becoming deleterious to their lifestyles and they're having to compensate in other areas then it's absolutely appropriate that a foundation should exist to take care of funding that person and making sure that the, the, the that the project itself, that the mission itself is abided by and is, and is true, but not when you start getting too much money involved, you're going to get corruption and you're going to get people that want the power and people that want power should never be allowed into power in the first place. And this is what I've noticed. Even Tom, when you started, I perhaps shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. You, you, when you started posting up those Twitter pictures, I had a couple of people come up to me at the London Bitcoin meetup, start sort of, you know, getting friendly with me. And you know, one of them owned a company, and he wanted to put a like, if you get elected, could you do this for? Me? Hang on a minute, the corruption's already started. There's been like four tweets, and you're already like cozying up to me for contracts. Seriously, I can't imagine That's what it would be like. Tweet. I shouldn't have said it because obviously I, I, I don't want to upset anyone. But like, I, I have no, I, I don't want power. Okay, I don't want it. Like, if I get it, if 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 I do pull it off as a coup, if I decide to even do it at all, um, I will just be to, as a protest candidate. Okay, I will just be doing it to make a point and probably just set up my own one. You know, and and you should all do that. Right? Like you should all like like we're going to talk about the whole thing in a minute. So maybe I should put the, that off until we do. But anyone can be a leader. You don't have to be a part of an official organization. Also, the other thing is, look at what happens when. I mean, Charlie Schramm. I mean, it's a tragic case. I listened to his interview on Let's Talk Bitcoin. The guy just looks like he's been uh, totally had. You know, he's volunteered some information to the authorities thinking he's doing the right thing, he's acting in an honest way and then they've used that information against him later on um, on chumped up charges. God, I was when I heard him say that I was like, oh man, that's awful. But the problem is that that's going to tarnish Bitcoin uh, even though it's not his fault and certainly with, with Mark Carpellas is that that then ends up making us all look bad because they've got that logo on it and it just looks to me as though these people in this organization um, aren't taking due care and responsibility. I don't know about this two-bit um, guy. Uh, it just looks like he's on a bit of a power trip to me. I will listen to him because he clearly looks like he's a smart guy. I'm not liking his posturing. Ultimatums are not a good a good thing. It's usually a sign of weakness when someone does that. So anyway, look, I don't know. I, I, I let's just move on from it. I think. Yeah, I, I was got. of the impression, um, and I. I, I, this was an early impression, and I feel like it's been reiterated for me that the one of the main purposes, if not the main purpose, as Chris, uh, you were mentioning earlier, is that the Bitcoin Foundation is to it exists to protect Bitcoin and thereby pay the core development team. And um, you know, recently, I think in the last two months or so, there's been some comments coming out of core developers saying they're not sufficiently supported. Um, I think those comments were more directed at uh, the core dev teams of the larger Bitcoin businesses not contributing enough to the code to make it more robust, and this is around the transaction malleability time and things like that. But, it, it, and I certainly, I mean, that is the most noble function they could ever perform. And if, mm. they're, if the core devs are not supported or, or claiming they're not being supported enough, then we've got something wrong going on. Yeah, I agree. And when you guys say that all the foundation should do is pay the core devs, I think to myself, this is a job for a multi-signature wallet. Mm -hmm. You know, if everyone could agree these people are doing the work and they should be yeah. paid this percentage, and we could all sign it, and then we have an agreement, what do we need the foundation for? 
Well, I think it's a case of uh, uh, I think it's a case of you know again these old habits die hard and when you have the le hands on the levers of power um, you know it could have been some trumped up organization that just you know got a large endowment and became um, you know powerful in some new fledgling industry and I'm not saying you know that that's the Bitcoin Foundation but some people look at it that way perhaps uh, you know that's there are problems, and it doesn't seem like there's enough communication. You know, I really like John Matonis's writing um, when he when he posts things in Forbes and, and contributes to other uh, you know other publications. I think he's a, an incredibly bright guy. I don't know much about Peter Vicenis, um except the Coin Lab stuff, but you know, I don't know what they're doing. I don't think any of us really do. And if multi-signature wallets are not something they're into or interested in doing, it must be because these old habits die hard, and they are. Yeah, maybe that's a good idea, but I'd still rather be holding purse strings. I like that. It's tough to tell. We'll have to wait and see until the article comes out. Exit question. Will they resign on Monday? Follow-up. Will they resign after he publishes? Derek J. Still muted. Thank you. If they've done something criminal, I'm sure they'll step down, but... Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Uh, it seems like 2-Bit Idiot would do well to form his own foundation, to um, proselytize on behalf of Bitcoin, and accomplish whatever he hopes to accomplish without the foundation. It doesn't seem to be uh, some prerequisite that he be a part of this foundation in order to accomplish anything. So it's irrelevant to me. Will Pangman. Uh, I don't want to answer the first two questions, but I, I, I want to point out that, um, you know, like Derek said, if there was some illegal activities going on, perhaps they will resign. Uh, I don't think it matters. You know, the, the article, the way he writes it, is like threatening that this could bring down or sully the name of Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I'm completely unconvinced of any of those kinds of arguments whenever they're made by a Bitcoin quote-unquote insider or a total outsider, you know, like in the mainstream media that we've seen ongoing all the time, incessantly. Um, Bitcoin is resilient, and it's resistant to all of these kinds of things. And if anybody thought that we'd be on a constant upward trajectory the whole time, then that's totally foolish. Uh, something as disruptive as this, as massively disruptive as this, more disruptive than perhaps anything humankind has ever seen, isn't going to be a smooth ride on the way up. It's going to be very, very bumpy. And if we have another, you know, the, the last five weeks of press and stories about Bitcoin has been a pummeling. And here we are. We're still around 650 or 625 uh, per, you know, per Bitcoin. Uh, I don't see that really dramatically changing anytime soon. And we'll have some bumps and hiccups and stuff. But we're going to ride it all the way to the moon, however long it takes to get there. And, and, you know, I, I'm not worried about Bitcoin's future as it pertains to any sort of news that can come out about it, you know, short of some catastrophic internal failure, like, um, you know, certainly is a massive outlier, as, you know, sometimes Andreas will indicate. Uh, yeah. Are they in some way responsible for the losses of Mt. Gox? I don't know about that, but I am interested to know if the claim that uh, Ryan makes in the article that they had special privileges and could withdraw funds when other customers couldn't, and then that's something I think we, um, you know, that's a, that's, that's a serious matter. Chris J. Um, I have no idea. Um, I think that he will probably publish something just because he did last time. So I, I, I trust too bit that, that he will follow through. I just don't like his style at the moment. But I have no idea what's going to happen. Issue three. Whole Council Exploring Bitcoin. Kingston upon Hull, usually referred to as Hull, is a city and unitary authority, unitary authority area in the ceremonial county of East Riding of Yorkshire, England. The Bitcoin Group's own Chris J went there recently to give a talk about how cryptocurrency can help bring justice to poverty. Chris J, how did it go? Were they open to Bitcoin? 
Oh, open to it? You're kidding me. They've already spent a sizable chunk of money on mining equipment, actually not for Bitcoin, but for, for Feathercoin and, and Litecoin, I believe. And so they I don't want to say how much because I might be getting somebody into trouble. But when uh, David, uh, the guy um, who's doing it, told me how much they'd spent, I was like, oh, really? <laughs> um, but I was assured this wasn't taxpayers' money. This was a grant that they were given and they were told to use at their discretion. Um, so I believe they have an informal arrangement um, the, the, the people that we were liaising with uh, had come down to our meetup at, at Oxford a couple of weeks ago. This is all a thanks, by the way, um, to uh, David Gilson. I want to give a shout out. He's at David Gilson on Twitter. He's a very good journalist. He works for Coindesk. He did the story on Feathercoin's first meetup in Oxford uh, back in the summer, did a really good write-up, and then has been very good to us ever since. Has been recommending us to people. So they came down all the way from Hull, which, by the way, costs about 100 pounds or if not more on a return ticket and um, spent a lot of the time with us just talking they actually did a live stream interview um, talking about their reasoning behind it and what they want to do is they want to be able to give uh, create a kind of pegged currency like a local hull coin um, to a string of cryptos to try and stabilize the volatility a little bit so you're not just putting all, all of your coins into one basket and then give it out to people on benefits right give it out onto people on social uh, social security benefits um, and I think the thinking is like what's to lose right these people um, aren't expecting this anyway they're, they're getting the money for free it's a great learning exercise to see how this can work they demoed an SMS um, I don't know if it was an SMS wallet, but it was an SMS communication platform uh, where the council could talk to people that perhaps had gone into debt. Uh, if they needed help, they could stay in touch with them. Um, communication is, is pretty important. Actually, there were a few also volunteer organizations. There was also somebody from Job Center Plus, and there was also an organization called Quids In, which is a community project designed to help people that uh, ha are or going into arrears aren't paying their rent. I actually told them they should go to the banks and help them out because apparently they've got some debt problems of their own. It's not so much the poor they need to worry about. Um, so I did a presentation to them on the virtues of the blockchain. Now, I've done this presentation maybe nine or ten times now. It's getting better each time I do it. And what's different about the presentation that I give, um, what, well, what I've tried to develop with this anyway, I don't know if it's any good or not, um, is I just make it about the network mostly. I try not to talk about it as money and I just talk about it as the self-stabilizing uh, global dialogue, that, that dialogue with the memory. And when you talk about it in those terms and you take away the money and you take away the economics and make them, you know, really help people to feel like they're, they're getting in on something, like you're about to learn something that most people should know, they just don't take the time on it. That kind of, I find it really helps. So I've got this slide deck that I'm using, it's public, I've tweeted it out, I think I can tweet it out again for people. It's open source, anyone can take it. Um, I find it really works. So I did it, I went through it in about 15 minutes, and the first thing I got was pushback, right? So not not from uh, David and the team from Hull, but, but some of their colleagues in the audience who are only hearing this for the first time about getting, you know, crypto into members of the public in Hull. And I got a lot of pushback and a lot of people were kind of saying, oh, this is too complicated, people are stupid, they won't understand it. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but actually what we found was that over time we persevered. I made sure that they understood that there was as much that we could learn from them as they could learn from us. Like That's a really important message. It's absolutely true. Bitcoin needs to start humbling down and learning as a community we need to start thinking about what we can learn from local communities it's not about going to a town and saying look guys you're going to love it it's got 21 million fixed issuance deflationary model you know the hell with your Keynesian crap no you can't do that because people have certain um, cultural heritage sensitive practices in their background they they want what they can trust now what's good news not good news but um, what's beneficial to us in this community is that the banks are trust even less um, so when when you talk about when I talked about the banks when I when I, I use the analogy I said right everyone's gonna lend me some money okay then I'm gonna go to the casino and we're gonna cut you a deal if I win you get three percent of my profits if I lose you bail me out 
and of course everyone laughs because that's exactly what happened in 2008 and so they know it's true no one's disputing the premise no no one's saying that the, that we're not trying to solve the right problem and what happened was as you kind of break down these barriers and you make it safe for people to get things wrong and you let them ask the naive questions without them feeling embarrassed about it, they start to come up with their own ideas and they start to go, so one question that, was, that might come up a lot for other people watching this video if you're going to go out to your local community and try the same thing is, well why can't we just make our own hull coin, well, why, why do we have to use someone else's or, and, and stuff like that. And I said, well, look, if you use an existing network, first of all, they've already got the hash rate. I'm not, I wasn't selling Feathercoin, by the way. I was saying, I was speaking abstractly of all coins. And I said, well, you've already got a global network of developers that have already built the software for free. You wouldn't have to commission new developers to write it. You'd have a constant 24-hour resource at your disposal. You'd have a GitHub with everything that you needed, documentation and all. Just download it and fork it. If you, if you want to reskin it, you can reskin it. If you want it to, to be more vanity, then you can do that. But there's really no need for you to reinvent the wheel. And it makes no difference to the user either. Like the user doesn't care whether it's the Brixton pound or the whole, like we have a currency in the UK called the Brixton pound, which is not a blockchain based currency. It's a private uh, ledger, it's a centralized ledger, um, quite innovative, but it, it's just designed to keep the, the currency local, it's protectionist, it, it, it's designed to keep the money within the, the small town of Brixton. So we said, look, it, it doesn't make a difference whether we're using it on a blockchain, as far as the user's concerned, it's all the same thing. It's just that, and I showed them, I actually have a graphic of the protocol up on the screen. I help, I find that helps as well as a visual aid. And I said, look, that's JP Morgan's business model right there, reduced into about 10 lines of code. You've basically automated away a building full of bankers. That's why you, you need to use this software it completely does away with all the all the expensive glass buildings with the air conditioning and the penthouse apartments you don't need all of those overheads and so at the end you know we actually have people coming up to us going okay how how can we get involved in this you know how can we how can we start this they were coming up with ideas because then once we'd kind of got over that hurdle and, and we sort of made it safe for them to take this risk because that word risk was used a lot we, we ended up at the conclusion of like, well, not taking a risk is a risk, so what have we got to lose at this point? Because I think that Hull is, you know, is not in good shape at the moment. In fact, anywhere outside of London is not in good shape at the moment in the UK. Um, they actually started to think about managing upwards. They started to think about how they could like just get this around. Yeah, I could talk. Can you talk to Tony and I'll just talk to Mike and you we can sort something out. That's what I really liked about the meetup. Was after a while, Bitcoin can really spark your imagination. It really does set people alight when they start to realize what they can do with this. So I was really proud. I was really happy. Um, and they've asked me to to come up again and I'd, I'd happily do that. Um, so yeah, let's let's scale this. Let's keep doing this because now the UK now treats. Um, so here I am being like anti-government and everything. So now I'm about to say something positive about our government. So this is a actually a local authority. It is a government elected authority in the UK, having now declared that Bitcoin is like sterling, is like pounds. Um, we now they're treated in the same way for tax for for VAT purposes. We've now got a local government. Um, actually endorsing cryptocurrency, going further, actually buying mining equipment and mining with that equipment with the view to, to dispensing it to their local population. That's pretty that's pretty powerful stuff now. That sounds really exciting and it could be that that grant that turns into mining equipment could turn into more money. That they that's could it. Up taking that's it. Off this and maybe have an everlasting grant, some some kind of magical thing. Yeah. Uh, just to open it up to the rest of the panel. Uh, Derek J, what effect can cryptocurrency have on po on poverty? Is the whole government on the right track? Wow. Well, two very different questions. First of all, I want to sincerely applaud the work of Chris J going and doing the difficult work of being a role model and putting yourself out there to tell people about this uh, currency who are really going to benefit from it. 
Uh, I myself don't think I could go and talk with a bunch of government people, not voluntarily, and so I applaud you for doing that as well. Uh, is what, uh, what is Bitcoin's impact on poverty? Well, we can look to Africa. Uh, Chris mentioned, you know, one of the things he'd like to see the Bitcoin Foundation do is direct more of its energy at uh, third world countries, places that are in development, and show them how Bitcoin can uh, uh, make their lives easier and, and keep their uh, currency sound. Um, that's just two things. Most countries run, if not all countries, run on fiat, and uh, that really hurts the poor because the people who get to spend the money first are the, the wealthiest and most politically connected, and then the little people at the bottom are who get to use the money last. Um, it has this multiplier effect. Uh, the inflation <laughs> has its own effect, and um, going through Econ 101 in, in five seconds there, it results with the, the poor people having uh, less money, uh, less purchasing power. And with Bitcoin, since it's uh, not based on fiat, the people uh, all have the same purchasing power. And uh, I think that's a positive thing uh, right off the bat that most people don't see initially because inflation is this hidden tax. Um, so I, I think that's just to, to name a couple of things. Uh, the third world, peer-to-peer uh, -peer spending uh, it, among communities, whether they're poor or not, it doesn't matter. They can all spend this currency. And uh, the fact that they don't get hit by this inflation tax the way they do with fiat currencies, that's all going to help the poor in pretty significant ways. Finally, I would mention that the poor are often the, the innovators and the entrepreneurs who work to become you know, the, the uber rich, right? Because they're willing to take all these risks, they've got nothing to lose, and uh, they can outbid their competition, or underbid their competition, rather. Well, with Bitcoin, we're going to see that even become more and more possible as the, the poor don't need a bank account in order to accept funds from anywhere in the world. Boy, that's the first time we've ever been able to say that, and I think it's going to have a huge impact on the type of businesses we see in the next 10 years. Absolutely. Will Pengman, your thoughts on the whole council? Yeah, I want to echo Derek and applaud Chris for his, um, you know, just the victory. I mean, that's, that's what it is. I want to underline what exactly, you know, my, what I internalized from what Chris described about uh, his moment in front of the, you know, the Hull city government. Um, at the end of the day, people in positions of power, holding office in government, they're just people. And what Chris was able to do was articulate to these people how they can have a noticeable effect on the community that they're, you know, administering, if you will. You know, the, it's a depressed area, as Chris is mentioning, and, you know, all these, all these towns in the UK outside of London are suffering in this way. And I know lots of cities in America can, we can point to similarly, you know, Oakland, California, uh, Detroit, parts of Cleveland, even parts of Milwaukee around here. Um, and there's many others, um, many others. And, and doing this for their community, I mean, they, when nobody likes to drive through their community or, or you know, live and work near places like this and, and see the, the suffering that's going on. And so even if they're in, you know, even if they stand to benefit from the system or the status quo remaining, um, there's a um, moral incontinuity there uh, in, in those people at some point. Um, and again, these aren't people on the top of the pyramid, so to speak. So um, maybe being a little closer to, closer to, the, uh, to the issues, makes their hearts even a little more soft than, say, those who are um, in the ivory towers in the city of London and New York City and, and so on. What I'm just amazed at uh, the receptiveness uh, and, and the conversion that Chris was able to create in these people uh, and that they were so quick to act with a huge gesture, it sounds like, um, you know, to invest in mining equipment that, as you said, Thomas, can perpetuate this grant practically indefinitely if they maintain it. Um, I mean, it's, 
it leaves me short of breath. It's so exciting, you know. It's um, it, it's it's why this invention came to be. It's what it's meant to do. This is what Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and the blockchain and decentralized distributed um, networks were made to do. They were made to uh, give people a way out of of their circumstances that are b otherwise. Um, handed down to them and, and, you know, depressing them. I mean, that depression is uh, a pressure from above, you know. It's, in many cases, not really even self-inflicted because it's, um, it's from a, a larger cause, you know, um, a cause of greater power or whatever, imposing itself on, on these areas and bleeding them dry of their wealth and bleeding them dry of their energy. And um, it's, just, it's just incredible. I want to see this idea go viral. I want more people to get their hands, get in touch with Chris, get their hands on this presentation and find a way to deliver it to their communities. And, and maybe that's something we can do together. Uh, you know, yeah, Chris, absolutely. You know, I'd, I'd like to work on that with you. And I think anyone out there listening, um, please contact us. I think this could be an awesome project. This is the kind of thing the Bitcoin Foundation should be doing. Yes, uh, But exactly. we should do it, too. I mean, we, we, should just do we don't it. need a foundation to do this. Right. We, we don't need a foundation right. to do this, but in their right minds, that would be the thing, right? So, um, so let's take the reins, and, and there's no reason we have to wait for any decrees, you know? What does fiat mean? It means by decree, handed down by decree. Um, as Derek pointed out, Bitcoin is not backed by fiat or based in fiat. So, you know, well, it's, it's backed it, it's by the, the people. Who. It's the who of the fiat, though. It's, it's still fiat, but it's everyone deciding in unison. And, and the thing to remember here is that, that the role of a leader is to give the people beneath them everything they need to do their job, right? Leaders make leaders. They don't just rule people from behind and let them go off and take all the risks and then just sit back and luxuriate. Um, the code is the, the new law. Right, code is justice, and that's what the poor need. They need justice. I'm not going to throw money at this problem, hoping it's going to wait, going to go away. Money is just a multiplier, right? You throw money at a problem, you're just going to get more of whatever you started with. Actually, throwing technology at a problem without any sense of community or caring isn't going to solve a problem either. Mm -hmm. I think, hopefully, what I'm hitting on with this speech, what I've tried to refine over time, is a, a way of talking about Bitcoin. Um, and I, what I've tried to do, I hope I've been successful, is getting to its essence and what it is that it really is, which is this self-stabilizing dialogue. And when, and I keep playing with it, I keep playing with, I'm still not quite getting it with the mining, I'm noticing I'm getting a little bit of pushback on that, um, but I'm slowly, slowly perfecting it. I reckon I need another two presentations before it's kind of just right. We just need to stop talking about the money, like blanket, mm -hmm. just not, I mean, obviously talk that it's an issue, but don't don't even spend the first 10 minutes mentioning the money. Just talk about the network, the fact of how resilient it is, the fact that you can use it on your own computer, you could pick this up today, I could show you how to do it. That's the kind of thing that people need to be hearing. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, it's um... This should uplift anyone out there who's um, had their doubts and felt feeling downtrodden about anything. And you know, these these kinds of things serve as constant motivation for me. And um, you know, hopefully the same for for viewers out there as well. Uh, this is a this is a project worth doing. And and the message is you know how how bountiful open systems are, and how restrictive and self defeating closed systems are, except for those who, who can manipulate the closed systems uh, rules or whatever. So um, there are so many of these, you know, uh, we could get into a philosophical discussion about this, but uh, so much of how history is written is, is a closed system. Uh, so much of how we've been dictated uh, physics, how physics works, is closed um, and not, not realized as an open system. You know, uh, and this is the case throughout history. You know, physics on Earth is different than physics at the microcosmic level, or even at the, um, you know, the cosmic level, the you know, the universal level. So, and that's how it was taught to to constrain people's minds, and and so that's maybe why it's a good to, reason to avoid or um, set aside the money issue. 
uh, and focus on the fact that open source, open systems, um, and distributing distributing them. You're and starting fostering with that. Simon Sinek's got a great quote. He says, "People yeah. buy why you do it, not what you do." And yeah. so you start with the why. And if you just talk about the money straight away, then what you're doing is you're appealing to people's sense of greed, and you're appealing to you're appealing to a sense of having, not a sense of being. Right? What your what Bitcoin stands for is a way of being, a way of mm. behaving, a way of conducting yourself. It shouldn't just be at the level of the code. It should be in the way you conduct yourself. Right. Honesty should pay more than fraud all of the time, not just in the mm. core protocol, but in the way you conduct yourself day to day with people around you. And mm -hmm. it should incentivize you to behave honestly. If you've got the opportunity to put your funds in a multi-sig wallet and you can proof of reserve all of your funds, that should be a powerful, in fact that very idea came up at the very end in a brainstorm mm. where um, one of the people there did say let's set up a whole bank and uh, we can prove that we've got all the funds there. Well you've instantly, instantly disintermediated Barclays, you've been disintermediated mm. in HSBC because you're already doing something they're not. These people, these companies have 40, 30, 40 to 1 lending ratios. That means mm. that a very small percent of their loans have to go bad and you've got systemic failure. That's yeah. your money. That's not them that's going to pay for it. They've already got their salaries and their bonuses. That's locked yeah. in. They locked in that profit. You didn't. It's no, Money needs constant attention. It needs constantly checking to check that it's there and you've just outsourced that awareness to somebody else, somebody you've never met before. Yeah, I, I want to tell one little story um, just about the leaving the money aside and why, th why that makes sense. Yeah, I was uh, engaged in a discussion. Someone I was talking to was really upset about welfare queens. It's a you know, term we have in America for folks who live off the dole and exploit the dole, you know, have more children to get more uh, greater welfare check or sell their food stamps for cash and do what they want, you know, these kinds of practices. And this person I was talking with was saying how um, how how terrible and garbage you know the people who do that is and I replied with you know I don't see what they're doing is wrong it, it sounds like what they're doing is smart they're you know they've figured out the rules and it's a little bit of entrepreneurial spirit going on in there I, I have a problem with the welfare system in the first place you know that it's you know predatory in that in that sense to cause those people to do that and and be dependent on it and then also that uh, it exists in the first place you know, and it's, it's forced on the rest of everybody. You know, this person is someone who doesn't want to pay into a system like that. So that's what they were upset about. And then, you know, they, they mentioned to me, like, well, how would I get around that? Or how would we stop this problem? And I said one word, Bitcoin. And they had questions about that. They said, oh, so, you know, you would just rather have, um, uh, you know, you want to see your Bitcoins go up in value and, and all those kinds of stuff. And I, I said, you know what, the value of Bitcoin is irrelevant to the point I'm making here. I don't care what the price of Bitcoin is, but you know, in teaching these people, these so-called welfare queens or people who exploit these government programs, teaching them about this can give them far more value than they could get from these government programs and continuing to stand in line and fill out forms year after year, month after month or whatever. Uh, and, and this person was sort of um, stopped at that moment and they realized you know, because they were they were stuck in that greed cycle that Chris mentioned. They were thinking hey, about the money thing. Very bad for those people, Will. I I mean, I want to believe that uh, yeah, people are going to take full advantage of the Bitcoin currency. But let's be real: the people who are on the the dull, uh, people who are are welfare queens, as you put it, are more addicted to getting a, a blank check every month than incentivizing themselves to, to learn something new, right? So uh, I think with Bitcoin could do more harm than good to these people because when people have full uh, ability to decide whether or not they're going to send their money somewhere or if they, if they don't support this welfare scheme, as you're talking about this person didn't support, then they're not going to send the money. And right now, people don't have an option. So let, let me just counter with, with the point that, you know, in working in social services for some part of my professional career, I saw a lot of people who were very dependent on these systems. Uh, some of them were looking for a way out. Some of them were happy to continue taking what they were getting. Um, but all of them, almost all of them, had a little side game going on that was like a little, a little entrepreneurial project of, of theirs. And 
I, all I'm saying is that you, 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 you know, give them a little bit of it. Obviously, lift, the education part is important. I totally agree with you there. And, and it's irresponsible to just dump uh, cryptocurrency on these people. You got to lift them up, and, 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 it, and if they're interested, educate them on it. But what, I, what I'm getting at is that there is entrepreneurial spirit going on. They're selling their food stamps to get cash to then go and do their off-the-books businesses that they're doing in their communities. And whatever these these may be, you know, uh, I saw them going on all the time, and I was like, man, if they could just take that practice, that energy that they've got, and you know, just start to wean themselves off, but they of course can't. But assist, but with with the help of something that appreciates and something that empowers, like Bitcoin, and which are, you know, food stamps do not do, which uh, other other welfare programs do not do. Um, that was the point I was getting at. That you know, you you, you give these people, uh, you you nurture that side of it, and and people don't have to do that for other people. Cryptocurrency does that for people when you participate in it, when you first send it. I mean, we talked a lot about this at my meetup last night. We had a number of minorities. We always do in Milwaukee at our meetup. Come and and show up at our meetup, and they talked about this. Like they want to get bring this to their communities, to their aunts and uncles and cousins, and show them how it works. And the, and the we were talking about the difficulty they're in, like you're mentioning, Derek. The, the point I'm making is, you know, the price of Bitcoin is irrelevant. The price of the currency, the conversion rate is irrelevant. The, the, the technology is what's relevant. And I think that's what, what uh, I loved so much about um, what Chris's message was to the city of Hull. Yeah, I think one of the important things is I, I do have quite a strong view on, on, on how to help these people just because I've, I've been there myself and um, I've been working on this idea for a few years. Um, if you want to change somebody, you've got to change the context. There aren't very many people in the world that can change other people because most people have a hard enough time just changing themselves. Really, you're not going to be able to help somebody else find their potential until you've understood yourself. And the problem is there's lots of people out there that love going around telling other people what to do with their lives, but they're not being honest with themselves, not being frank about their situation and thus they end up making it worse. Look, like I said, you're not going to be able to throw money at this problem hoping it's going to go away. But what's different about uh, using a cryptocurrency, especially a deflationary one with fixed issuance supply, is that it's not free. The money that the uh, poor have been given in the past has come from the government. That has been free money because the government can always print more money. And so it was abundant. And now we've got a problem that the banks, I'm talking specifically about the UK, I can't speak about anywhere else, but the banks in the UK now are rushing to recapitalize their balance sheets, hoping they can cover their losses in time, they can get away with this and start again. And what that means is they can't just print to infinity because that would be insane. Um, but what they are, what that does mean is that we have had to have all these austerity measures. Why? Because the pound is a globally traded uh, commodity on the currency exchange, the forex market, which is the largest market in the world. It's something like five trillion dollars a day or something stupid like that. And as a result, the UK government has to be seen to be saying the right things for the speculators. And one of those things is we have to have austerity, even though it's made virtually no impact on, on the balance sheets of the, of the government ledger, just because it, you know, it dwindles in comparison. I mean, I've been trying to find out the official figures of the addressable tax base in the UK. I'm led to believe, I don't have this on firm evidence, I'm led to believe that the addressable tax base in the UK is about five trillion pounds. But of that five trillion, only about 10 to 20 billion actually gets taxed. And who are taxed? The people that can't afford to defend themselves are taxed, right? So in actual fact, what you could just do is just tax Google half of the actual corporate rate as it stands and not tax anyone else and still raise the same amount of money. It would make virtually no difference to that to, to Google. I mean, look at Apple. What did they do with all their surplus cash? They they inflated the bond market. I mean, look at what Google's doing. Google's buying up London property so that it appreciates in value. That's, why don't they just pay, pay the staff more, pay more tax, rather than sticking it into all these foreign markets and creating all these bubbles. It just doesn't make any sense. So that's why the, the benefit culture worked for a while, was that it, it, it created comfort. It was actually quite uh, insidious because it, it ended up creating a dependency on the part of the people claiming it 
And then all of a sudden when it turned out that you actually needed that money for something else and actually there are political reasons why we can't give it to you anymore because you know the tabloids will have a field day and the speculators won't like us. What you get with a cryptocurrency is it's not free money. So when Hull City Council have all that mining equipment, that is a scarce finite resource. They can't just give this away. Uh, to, to anyone and the people that get it too will start to feel a sense of like okay I can't just fritter this away because it is actually um, scarce but it isn't just about the money you've also got to help people like I do career coaching I have a, a, a I'm not plugging anything because I don't I don't charge for it but future.do it's a future facing CV where you have to say what you want to do with your life rather than what you've done and it's all about getting people to to tell themselves a different story about themselves like the story we tell ourselves about ourselves really informs the way we understand our possibilities people paint themselves into corners and they tell themselves they can't do anything and they reduce their own options and they just get in their own way and and part of it is just about listening to people and and because a lot of these people just haven't been listened to at all all they ever do their experience when i went out and i went to job seekers um, job Center Plus is when I was doing my research for my future CV project a lot of people I spoke to looked like nobody had ever listened to their point of view before all they'd ever had was people like they would interrupt me expecting me to, to interrupt them they, they were sort of waiting for me to tell them what to do next it's like I'm not telling you anything I just want to hear your story like like how did you get here what, what, what do you want what did you want to be when you were a kid you know that question gets people a lot um, like I find that really successful people are often people that always remind themselves of what they wanted to be before they were told what they wanted to be if that makes sense like um, yeah that's it. it it's something to do with society telling you that you are a certain way and then you living up to that expectation because that was apparently what you were supposed to be and just trying to undo that I'm not saying that Bitcoin solves all these problems, it doesn't, it certainly doesn't, but what it does do is it gives you a very powerful tool, a constraint that you can turn into a variable, a constraint that you can actually use to free people, because freedom isn't the same as emancipation, freedom is work, freedom is art, and, and I, I think that justice really, I want to go all the way back to Socrates, and he said that justice is everyone minding their own business, and what he meant by that was people just focusing on what their art, doing what they wanted to do and not interfering on other people's affairs where they had no, no, no uh, place being there. I actually think that pe peace is not the absence of conflict. It absolutely is not. Peace is art, it is work, it should be effortful and we should want to do that work. It shouldn't be, you know, I, oh yeah, sure, war scales, whatever, yeah, you want to be big just so that you can have some control. Um, so that that's what I, I I don't know all the answers yet is what I'm saying, but I do think that this is the beginning of something that we can actually give people a way of frictionlessly like look at all these business ideas. So I, I I do go out to like local communities right, and you meet people and they are very entrepreneurial. We had the London riots in 2011 in the in London. I wasn't even in London at the time, but I was watching them from abroad and. Um, how entrepreneurial were these kids, right? Like they were buying vans and raiding these shops in in the middle of the thing. They were like commissioning people to like go hire a van so they could ram raid the shop whilst all the all the police were preoccupied elsewhere. They were then selling this stuff on eBay. Like these guys were really entrepreneurial. Not one person sat down with them and said, you know what, if you could take that that potential and you could take that, you know, business acumen and actually apply it to somewhere do you see what I mean? Like I just felt like it was an utter, utter waste of human capital that nobody had bothered to sit down with these young people and try to find their potential and try to work out like, you know, rather than me just telling you what what I think you should do, maybe I should just stop talking and listen to you and see what it is you might want to do. Does that does that make any sense? Sounds good. Moving on, issue four. Let's see. Mount Gox, 180,000 Bitcoin moving. 180,000 Bitcoins, believing to be the personal Bitcoins of Mark Carpella, stored in a Mount Gox account, however, have started moving. Blockchain walker, watchers are tracking this exciting development with bated breath. Could this be the beginning of refunds for Mount Gox customers? 
or is someone trying to move their ill-gotten gains? Will they get away with it? Your thoughts, Will Hangman. Well, I was struck when most by this this uh, Mount Gox stuff uh, a few weeks ago when Mark Carpellis admitted that he's temporarily uh, the the funds are temporarily unavailable. Um, they're out of his control essentially. So. I'm more interested in what that means, um, and then maybe perhaps connecting that to this recent movement of a large amount of funds. Um, if if they were temporarily unavailable, or is that is this the balance that he was referring to? Partially, I'm sure. Uh, and then, if so, maybe he's not the one moving them. So, uh, I'm sure our venerable grassroots Bitcoin community detectives will be hot on the trail, and um, will uncover something soon. As usual, there's been no communication from Mount Gox. Chris, <laughs> no Jay, doubt. Your thoughts? Oh man, there's been some class trolling, hasn't there, on this story since the beginning? So, like uh, the uh, there's a Facebook page of like this PR company claiming to own Gox.com, and they're sort of coming out with these hilarious posts. There was even a post of a video of Mark Carpellis in his uh, moment on TV claiming that he was blinking SOS. Like he was blinking this secret code, giving everyone a warning. The trolls are, are, on this Gox story are on top form. I'm not saying this is a troll necessarily, but I'll say again what I've been saying so far. Just assume the funds are gone, okay? I, we don't know for sure. It looks on the balance of probabilities. It does look like it's it's the, the private key is in control of Carpellas because otherwise why would the coins have moved now? Why wouldn't they have moved? No attackers, no thief is going to wait and pl take their chances. They're going to want to get the coins straight away. But if, yeah, if you do have coins in Gox, I think you should just live your life as if they're gone. On, and then at least if they aren't, you'll be pleasantly surprised. Derek, Jay. Yeah, so I've been following this, and I've been curious whose coins are they, where are they, what happened, uh, and up until today, I believed that they were in the hands of government agents, uh, and I thought that it was clever wording by Carpellis to say that the, uh, the keys were inaccessible, or I think it was his wording, not that the, the bitcoins were... Uh, gone, but that they weren't in his control. And to me, that sounds like someone who's got a gag order where the government came in and took their stuff and said, you know, you, you can't control this anymore. But now that we see the coins are moving, I see that's not the case. It seems like if it's not Carpellis, it's an insider at Gox for sure. And they're looking to mix their own their coins. I mean, the reason I don't think it's a government agent is because they're not interested in mixing their coins. We never saw them do that with DPR's coins or uh, anything, any other thing. And nor do they have an, any incentive to, because they've got the veil of authority behind them, right? They've got this legitimacy that, well, when we take stuff, it's legitimate, and we don't need to hide what we've done. So it seems like it's an insider at Gox, and it's not a government agent, and I, uh, will they get away with it? That's an interesting one, because the blockchain has made it possible for people to do their own sort of investigative private reporting or private investigations, but we'll get a, a serious test of how good these mixing services are in the next couple of days. Exit question. Yes or no. Will Mt. Gox customers receive refunds? Will Pangman. I regrettably think it's unlikely. Chris, Jay. Uh, yeah, I think it's very unlikely. Derek, Jay. Yeah, I think they will receive uh, refunds, at least in promise only. I don't think it's going to be what we're used to, like, oh, here's the money, sorry. It's going to be like, you know, you'll get paid out within the next 10 years. We promise to make good, blah, blah, blah. It'll be settled in fiat. You know, just something to save face, I would hope. I, that's what I would think. Did we, see the go did we see, like, the, um, the thing on uh, MasterCoin we're thinking of creating a Gox coin? an actual tradable coin for every coin that was in there. It's actually not a bad idea. Life on Bitcoin posted it out. I kind of looked at it briefly. Did you guys see that? 
Yeah, I've heard about it. Um, I, I like it. It's a, I think it's a Humint project, which is the, the company that allows you to create your own altcoin. You know, they'll create it for you. You give them the specifications. It's a great yeah. idea. I think it's partially the brainchild of uh, Adam B. Levine of Let's Talk Bitcoin. And, okay. Um, and no, there's some recent talk... Um, in, a, in their most recent episode, they do discuss it. I haven't had a chance to check it out, but I did read through um, some early drafts, I think, or something like that of the proposal, and it sounds like a great idea. I mean, who knows? It, it it's a tradable it's a tradable thing in and of itself, and it's certainly if it can be um, it, if it can be uh, provably ascribed to the depositors, you know, pretty well. If the accounting can be uncovered, you know, if if Mt. Gox mm. can submit their balance sheet mm. so that the, the right allocation can be made to each person, I think it's a great well, idea. It could, it could actually set a whole new paradigm for how to deal with bankruptcy. When I looked at the idea, I thought, oh, wow, this is really cool. This could actually pave a new way for recovering because one of the points that has been made is that Gox do have something like $30 million dollars. Uh, in cash so it's not as if they can't bootstrap another company all that has to happen is that Carpellus needs to just step aside and someone needs to take over with that capital what I'd like to see him do is give away a sizable chunk of his money I'd like to see him take a substantial hit to his net worth actually I, I found him on LinkedIn funnily enough um, and his LinkedIn, actually, his LinkedIn profile is hilarious. It says that having moved on from the video industry or whatever he used to work on, he's now wanting to build something that's going to last. And I was like, oh, my God, he's obviously written that, you know, just before he set up MT Gox or, or you know, very early on. But the, the, those words, I'm, I'm building something that's going to last and is going to survive, and I'm like, oh, my word. He probably needs to change that. He probably hasn't checked his profile for a long time. So I, I do support that idea. I think they do have cash. I think for a lot of people that have lost money, they would appreciate you know, something rather than nothing because if it goes through regular liquidation, the people that get the money are the liquidators. They get their money first, then the government get their money, then insiders get their money, right? Because the first thing that you want to do when you're going bankrupt is you want to pick your own liquidator, number one, and number two, you want to protect yourself and your friends because you want to be able to go off and set another company and one of the things about liquidation is you can't manage another company afterwards so you need to keep your friends and I've seen it all too many times so this would actually be a very good uh, way around that alright we're running out of time but I'd just like to go through a few question and answers uh, apologies that my sound was too low I usually have the opposite problem we'll do some more sound testing in the pre-show next time hopefully take care of that I've turned it up now and moved the mic closer so it's probably twice as loud uh, silver miner wanted us to talk about the uh, 113 million in Gox Bitcoin moving through the blockchain and we did it was just a very prescient comment by silver miner uh, good evening everyone from coder trader he likes what Andreas has done in the donation fund program and he'd like to set this as a precedent for other types of fundraisers. Is there a guideline for creating one? I'm not sure there's a guideline, but you can pretty much do it yourself. Obviously, for this situation, it helps that Andreas is a trusted member of the community, and there's trust that he will do what he's said with the money. But beyond that, you put a Bitcoin address up, you put your goal up, you start fundraising, you start spreading the word, telling people what you're going to do, maybe create a video, talk about your background, and you're rolling. You're a Bitcoin fundraiser now. Yeah, I saw Andreas. Um, he posted a video verification with his PGP key so that you could verify that this fundraiser was authored by him. Um, that's another good idea. Um, yet another is perhaps I like Thomas's point about multi signature wallets being a solution um, for lots of things. This is probably another use case. Uh, you know, if if that's uh, an area of expertise in any way for, for this person, the, question, the person asking the question, um, perhaps do some digging and, and create a functionality so that, for example, you could give, um, in this case, Dorian Nakamoto, the ability to be one of the signers for a multi-sig transaction of this, you know, the, the donation recipient, right? So that's another suggestion. Moving the key is to be transparent. Absolutely. Transparency, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Uh, we've got a 
two-bit idiot should have waited for at least three confirmations before breaking the story. Very funny from Silver Miner. The Silver Miner also says that the guys at the Dark Wallet, Dark Wallet Project believe that the Bitcoin foundations are frauds. Uh, this could be revealed with the two-bit idiot article scheduled to be published on Monday unless they resign. James Canning asks our opinion about HunterCoin. It's the first cryptocurrency that's human mineable as well as machine mineable. The proof of work is in a video game that you play. Uh, I've read the basic things. It sounds like a cool idea. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts on HunterCoin? Oh, I love it. I've never heard of it, but an idea <laughs> of a coin that can be mined by humans playing video games appeals to me. I actually uh, covered it on the World Crypto Network on the day where I tried to keep up with altcoin announcements and found that I couldn't. I did about 20 altcoin announcements that day, and they just kept rolling in. And I, I learned about some cool ones in that episode, but not this one. I'd like to get back to that, and I'd like to do some more altcoin announcements. I think what's important is to try to put them into categories and to separate the truly innovative and interesting ones like HunterCoin, where they've obviously done work to make a game and use this game proof-of-work system, compared to the ones that are just photocopies and just exact copies of the previous coin. So he's got more information on HunterCoin from James Canning. Um, we have a question from Red Herring. Interesting name. He says, did you know Autumn Radke? Anything suspicious about her death? I personally didn't know her or know of her before the story broke. Uh, it's very unfortunate. They believe she has committed suicide. Uh, the story yeah, I, um, I, she's, she's from Muskego, Wisconsin, which is about uh, you know, 25 miles southwest of Milwaukee. And she's, uh, she's younger than me. I, I, I'm acquainted with some of her friends who did uh, a life celebration for her last night um, at a restaurant uh, near downtown. So um, I wasn't acquainted with her, but acquainted with her friends, talked uh, briefly with one of them. And, um, yeah, it's, it's sad, you know. Um, Milwaukee and Wisconsin in general exports a lot of really great talent. Uh, and this is true of lots of places, but I, I notice it because, you know, you know, there's there's some some great names that never come back. You know, Jeremy Scahill and Chris Farley, and I could keep going, but um, it's sad. It's so sad to lose a bright young entrepreneur, especially uh, one that's a female uh, role model for others too. So, um, yeah, I hope I hope I hope some the authorities can figure out what really did happen there. It's been very unfortunate, and it's also unfortunate the way it's being covered in the media. I know a lot of non-Bitcoiners have been repeating the phrase, the CEO of Bitcoin died. Mm -hmm. And then they think it's suspicious and they get involved in this suicide or not suicide. And it's not the CEO of Bitcoin. She's the CEO of a Bitcoin company, not the Bitcoin company. There is no the Bitcoin company. So it's unfortunate that it's leading to that confusion as well. Um, we've got a great question from Chad McDonald. When talking to new people about Bitcoin, what are some of your favorite phrases regarding the perception of value? And I think this, uh, this goes right into a question by Dan Emmons, who asked, did you guys find amusement in the stuff that Bitcoin fanatics say video? And pretty much we say the things that they say in that video. So I would check out the stuff Bitcoin fanatics say. A lot of it sounds like exact quotes from Andreas Antonopoulos or perhaps this show. It's a very funny video. He has another in the series of uh, things that Apple fanatics say, and I've definitely said a lot of those things myself uh, over the years. Uh, great I've, work I've, from the comedian. I've got one that I, I use from Roger Ver, otherwise known as Bitcoin Jesus, who said, the least interesting thing about Bitcoin is the price. I know many people have said it, uh, and so I attribute it to him. Others may attribute it elsewhere, but I think that's one of the best uh, phrases with regard to Bitcoin. All right. Just a few more questions we're going to get through. Have you heard of Spain coin, similar to the model of Aurora coin? This is the first I'm hearing of it. Uh, I thought Aurora coin sounded like a pretty good idea, and I think Spain coin on the face also sounds like a good idea. Um, Armando Vuitton writes, I am Satoshi. You're Satoshi. We're all Satoshi. Excellent sentiment. And David Howard writes that we're in a culture of media increasingly not taking responsibility for their actions. 
And this story is just another example. That's a great point, David. And Silverminer asked, is there any software that convert the, can convert the price of altcoins listed on Cripsy to fiat or BTC on the checkout page of an online store? I would like to accept all altcoins on Cripsy. I don't know if it's software, but there is a company called coinpayments.net. It's kind of similar to BitPay, but they allow you to accept pretty much all of the altcoins. They have an incredible list at coinpayments.net. So you can check that out. And we're doing pretty good. So I think that's going to be about it for questions. We're going to move on to predictions, which is everyone's favorite part of the show, where I ask you to predict the future. Are you ready, Chris J? I've got a sad prediction, which is uh, I, I do think that the number of suicides is going to go up um, in the finance sector uh, because it's not just um, this recent... Uh, sad case that was just mentioned. It's also there have been suicides at JP Morgan in the last few months. Uh, there have been some other suicides. I had a friend who recently at his company, somebody uh, in that company um, took their own life actually in a very public way that was quite traumatic for the staff there. So I do think that as some of these financial pressures bear down on us, I would just like people to be conscious of that. If you do know somebody who is struggling in life, um, you can save their life just by asking and just by talking to them and getting them to, to talk about their problems first. Absolutely. And in the United States, we have several suicide hotlines. If you're not feeling well, if you know someone that's not feeling well, please encourage them to call and ask for help. Uh, it's a very depressing prediction. I hope it doesn't come true. Yeah, me too. Yeah, we'll hear more stories about local governments like the one in Hull uh, taking on Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies of their own creation. Uh, I think that's a positive development, and uh, I'd like to see more of it going forward. Will Pengman. Uh, my prediction is that we are not done with the spate of massive news, uh, the stream of five weeks of just incredible, you know, I hate the term, but earth-shaking stories. Uh, some very positive announcements afoot, I think, um, that will be big, big movers. And then perhaps, you know, come Monday, we'll see what uh, what Two Bit Idiots got, or you know, in store. But um, some, I think there's my prediction is massive uh, news stories with regard to Bitcoin continue. Excellent. We've got a couple more comments from the questions. Uh, Silverminer checked it out, and CoinPayments.net had to close down because of FinCEN money transmitter laws. That's very unfortunate. I was just speaking to them uh, perhaps a week ago. They wanted to be mentioned on the show. That's that's too bad. That's a di disappointing development. Yeah, I was talking with them like a week ago as well. I got no indication of that. They were talking about growth and things. Uh, we will have to confirm that. We'll have to check out the web page, but right now uh, we have no reason to doubt Silverminer. We have one more question from Wrestling Jesus. Can you please ask someone to make a puppet of Derek J? <laughs> what? what does that mean? He just wants a puppet of you, man. Wow, cool. I, mean, I, I thought it was really funny, so I had to fit it in there. But I almost look like a mannequin the way I'm dressed. There you go. And finally, one more prediction. Satoshi Nakamoto is plugged in. He knows what's going on. He can see the media trying to find him, and he's one step ahead of them every time. However, he is responsive to our needs. He knows that we need to know what happened to the 1.6 million bitcoins and their keys. And I believe he just might tell us. We're running out of time. Until next week, bye-bye. <laughs>